Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lisa Harnish. We are officially recording today's CIW webinar, Are the Browser Wars Over? Uh, I'm here with Dr. James Sanger today and our special guests, Chris Rossi and Stephen Schneider. And I'll let James say hello to everyone. Good. Hello, everyone. Stephen, how are you doing? Excellent. Very good. Well, Stephen and I were uh, pleased to be bringing on uh, Chris Rossi, our senior web designer, a senior web designer from the University of Phoenix. How are you doing, Chris? Excellent, thank you. And Chris is uh, calling in from Tempe, Arizona. I'm from here from Olympia, Washington. Lisa is also uh, here in uh, or there in Phoenix, Tempe area. And Stephen, you're in Tennessee. I am in Knoxville. Oh, in Knoxville. So we've got a uh, pretty good saturation of the U.S. anyway. So what we want to do today is talk a bit with Chris. Um, and his experience at the University of Phoenix as a designer, talking about w uh, the browser wars and some of the things that he takes into consideration as he designs for different types of browsers. We'll be talking, for example, about the drop-off in IE6 and what that means to designers everywhere. It sounds like uh, it's kind of a uh, freedom sort of situation there, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, so our agenda today, we'll be talking about what CIW is, for those who don't know, uh, we'll uh, take a look at some presenter profiles here so you get to know Stephen and, and, uh, uh, Stephen and Chris better. Then we'll get right into the meat of the presentation. So uh, are you ready to go, Stephen? I am, sir. All right. How about you, Chris? You getting ready to go? I'm ready. All right. Well, first you've got to hear about what CIW is. And Chris uh, has worked uh, uh, for us before up until about four years ago. So he knows all about CIW. It's a skills-based education program. It takes a holistic approach to all things web and IT and education. It involves courses and certification exams. It's your one-stop shop. And we teach web development and design. So CIW means web development and design. It's a vendor neutral program. That means that we take the best vendor applications out there. For example, Adobe products, Microsoft products, open source, and we take a competency-based approach to ed education. So instead of learning an application, you learn about how to apply yourself in an entire profession. CIW is a globally accepted certification. About a million courses and exams delivered worldwide. Over 65,000 individuals are certified worldwide. The CIW is created by web experts, a community of web professionals, instructors, and technologists who get together globally and then design this program. So we take into account university uh, input from universities, from community colleges, high schools, and of course professionals. As a result, CIW is used worldwide, for example, by the Kaplan University, Western Governors University in the United Kingdom Home Learning College, the University of the West of Scotland in Scotland. Um, we have New Hebei University in China and many others. So we have secondary schools, community colleges, and learning centers around the globe all adopting CIW. We have an advisory council of that is a cross-section or a nexus of industry, academia, and government and non-for-profit organizations. So we work with representatives from the University of Phoenix, for example, right, Chris, and also Mesa Community College there in the Phoenix area, but also we get input from around the world. So the idea is that we basically listen to people from industry, from non-profit, from academia and government to make CIW better all of the time. As a result, CIW gets all sorts of accolades, and one of them lately has been from Internet.com, where CIW was named a top developer cert. It's one that puts developers on the fast track. And you'll all be getting a copy of this PowerPoint slide, so you can grab this URL and go take a look at it from yourself. And uh, Internet.com recommends CIW as one of the top five certifications. Um, number one and number two, the Microsoft and Sun or Oracle products. Um, are vendor-based, and CIW is, is the vendor-neutral approach that combines in-demand skill sets and also proven salary performance that makes CIW valuable to designers and developers everywhere. Well, let's get to know a little bit more about the presenters. Uh, there's me, for example. I've been an author for years working with uh, various magazines and uh, uh, providers, uh, sorry, publishers. Uh, uh, including Singress and O'Reilly. I've designed certifications, including CIW, CTP Plus, 
certifications for Symantec and others. Also do a bit of blogging up on the CompTIA IT Pro community and elsewhere. And I'm president of Certification Partners. Enough of that. Let's talk about Stephen. How are you doing, Stephen? Doing all right. All right. So we've got here an expert instructor in Stephen and an instructional designer uh, uh, trained uh, not only uh, in it by education but also with a school of hard knocks, right, Stephen? And, <laughs> Definitely uh, the hard knocks. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like <laughs> uh, like me, uh, Stephen is a, uh, an O'Reilly author uh, and lately has worked on the uh, latest edition of LPI Linux certification in a nutshell. How did that go for you? It was a it was a fun project to work on, um, yeah, and, and and I think it's doing pretty good. You guys can help and, me with my uh, Ubuntu installation that I'm trying to do, right? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. In fact, uh, uh, except for during this webcast, I, uh, I don't know about you, Stephen, but I use uh, Ubuntu about 100 percent of the time. I'm 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 on uh, on that OS as well, except for uh, right now because GoToMeeting doesn't run. In Linux. Doesn't want to run it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, formerly, Stephen has been a tenured professor uh, over at, uh, at the Tennessee uh, Technical Center over there in Harriman. Uh, so Stephen has a, a rich uh, education and technology background. Let's get to the meat of the matter here, Chris. How you doing? Excellent, sir. Over a decade of user interface design experience working with XHTML uh, cascading style sheets. You do a bit of SEO, but mostly along the lines of usability and accessibility and that sort of thing. And you're, you're uh, currently the senior designer over at the University of Phoenix, uh, where you are working on various websites, including right, phoenix.edu, uh, right, www.phoenix.edu. Tell us more about that. Yeah. New development for us. I work. Uh, for a uh, senior director, our whole group does, that is basically uh, does product development. And uh, as has been uh, profit education at the college level has been in the news lately. President mm -hmm. Obama wants um, people who invest in their private education to get uh, a usable return on their investment. And uh, for many colleges around the world, um, around the country I should say, that receive federal funding, we're doing our best to make sure all the students understand exactly what they're going to be getting, what they want to learn, what they what they want to spend, and what they want their return on, on to be. So we are reworking um, the very core of the very brand of the institution of Phoenix.edu is the most publicly visible website. So this is kind of interesting time to be in web design for uh, uh, educational space because you get to simultaneously redesign it rebrand it, repurpose it, and change the tone, voice, and it's making it more accessible and usable all at the same time. So it's a fun challenge. Wow. So you and your team are responsible for making the phoenix.edu. So when people go up to www.phoenix.edu, you're responsible for the rebranding of that and making sure that as a designer, that website fits in with the business goals and the educational goals of the University of Phoenix. Yeah, that, that's the new challenge. <laughs> Quite a challenge indeed. Well, you're certainly up to it. Um, so you can take a look here, folks, at uh, Chris's uh, education and past uh, experience. So let's get right in to what Chris's world looks like. You work with other designers, uh, obviously, in your team. Tell us about the size of your team and, and uh, maybe even kind of a day in the life of sure. you know, what Chris Rossi does. Sure. Um, I work with 15 other people. And when you work at a corporation that has a major web initiative or a major um, initiative for mobile devices or anything that is going to be um, publicly available in digital format, uh, generally you work with a team up to about 15 to 30 some people, quite often they're small teams, and they're usually going to be composed of three parts, uh, UI designers or interaction designers people who often have master's degrees in the discipline of making sites or information usable for people. Hmm. And uh, they'll have uh, various, they, they might have degrees in things like engineering or they might have degrees in design or they might have degrees in uh, even uh, linguistics or something like that. Or dedicated degrees in the new science of interaction design. Uh, you have visual designers who are primarily tasked with product development in a visual sense. Uh, I work mostly in that discipline now. Um, 
and you have web designers who are involved with taking those products from the uh, you know other designers and making them work on the web level web level or the uh, for a mobile device um, you might have a fourth group as we do which are who are researchers people who uh, have a dedicated lab space um, and who can perform audits of users to see how they use applications and can do usability testing and to observe people um, using uh, new products and to find out what kind of blockages or problems new ideas and concepts have in the product development of uh, the new website. So you segregate those responsibilities as a team then, to, uh, into, or into various teams then? Right? I, would say, I would say that what's quite common now in the corporate world, um, probably educational space as well, pretty much everywhere, even in startup companies, is for four, those four disciplines to be working together as a team. And responsibilities may shift among people, may drift, and want mm -hmm. to do more one than the other, or get involved more in testing of something they worked on. But those are generally some of the four core responsibilities that people might be assigned to. Thanks, Chris. Could you list them one more time just so everybody's clear on sure. that? I think, uh, yeah. Sure. Those would be like UI design or interaction designers, mm -hmm. visual designers, web designers, and researchers. Mm -hmm. And that, okay. that's pretty much the, uh, the breakout that we have on our team. Well, thank you very much. That uh, uh, clarifies things nicely about the teams. Now, when it comes to the browser wars, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on, you know, separating fact from fiction. And this is a term, by the way, that we didn't make up. That people have been talking about the browser wars ever since the ancient of days when Netscape was doing its thing and all that sort of thing. But what's your perspective on, you know, you know, dominance of the browser? Um, you know, what's happening in that space? What are some of the biggest things? You mentioned IE6 to me earlier before we, we, we got on this call. Tell us more, you know, from your perspective, what you've seen sure. out there. Sure. We had a big product uh, group meeting, three or four hundred developers uh, at a hotel, and our vice president uh, walked in, and uh, one of the first statements he made was, the browser is dead. And... Uh, you know, he, he trotted out some designs we'd done mm -hmm. for an iPad application and uh, very kind of exploratory stuff. But he's convinced, as are many others, that we're moving beyond the idea of the browser. Um, that's easier said than done when it comes down to it. <laughs> when you have the kind of training that, that you get, for example, with uh, CIW certifications, you learn the practical basis of applying your CSS, your style sheets. Uh, you right. learn about um, browser uh, screen resolutions, uh, designing for, for things to be visible above the fold, below the fold, things, very practical things like that for browsers as we've come to know them. That all still applies, but the added burden for the mm. designer today is to take all of that knowledge and think about it um, as a design that's going to work from a browser into a mobile device and then maybe into even desktop apps. Um, this morning I was looking at the new OS uh, release for Apple, Lion. We're currently on Snow Leopard. The next one's going to be Lion. And it is going to take the new approach of taking the idea of the iPad where the application is always full screen. And Lion is going to treat all applications that way. So you can see how a browser idea of interacting with content on a page, you scroll, you can swipe, and so on, onto the iPad. Now it's come full circle and affecting a major OS, the next release of Lion. So you can see how the browser itself may be becoming ubiquitous, and especially as we move into HTML5, with the canvas element of HTML5, in the future, the near future, people may not even realize they're on a browser. They yeah. Won't be, they won't be entering URLs. They may be in canvas space um, and be operating it as an application. And they may be swiping it. They may be scrolling. Uh, 
but the, the basic interactions that you will use and you can use your CIW training for all still apply, but you'll want to make them as extendable uh, as you can through other, other types of usages. So, um, but it comes back to the original question about IE. Um, you know, looking ahead, we see browsers becoming ubiquitous, ubiquitous in a way with HTML5. But for our actual web design team, the fact that we can now look at our browser stats and see yeah. that we have fewer than 7% IE6 users has liberated us from a management point of view saying, you know what, you don't really have to support IE6 anymore. What happened with IE6? You were saying that that has uh, been a major anchor, a major issue uh, for a Correct. lot of designers over the years. Correct. Um, uh, a lot of people taking CIW training will learn some of the convenient uh, hacks for applying a style to HTML uh, for IE6, like um, uh, the star hack, for example, where you hit star bracket, put in whatever um, CSS you need to make IE6 use the box model correctly. Browsers are built around the box model where um, box elements in the browser have uh, usage of a border, padding, yeah. interior padding, um, exterior margin, etc. IE6 fundamentally does not use the box model correctly. Uh, modern Mozilla, um, the uh, Chrome out of the box, and um, most of all the recent Opera browsers all correctly use the box model. Um, IE6 has been the glaring exception. Okay, so and because IE6 was one of the dominant browsers, you know, a, a large percentage, that, that limited what you could do as a designer and, and as a designer group. It did in a sense that it created extra work for a design team to have to think about how much of their design they wanted to bring over to the IE6 space. Okay. It created an extra task. So in the future, what you're saying is, is that, first of all, the, the, the standard desktop browser is something that sounds like it's going to standardize, uh, it's going to get over that IE6 hurdle, that sort of thing. But right. you also, is there kind of a situation here where kind of the death of the web, long live the web here? You said that you know, a, a lot of the web design skills that you pick up, no matter where, it can be applied to applications. But how much do you think, you know, will apps overtake and replace the web and that sort of thing? You know, this is, you know, I'm putting you, I'm making you put yourself on the line here, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think in many cases, uh, they're just going to live alongside them. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, people, so. people will, will be using uh, iPhone and Android apps in a, a great example would be a, an app like Evernote, which is a very popular uh, note-taking, um, screenshot grabbing, anything you want to throw at it, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Very popular app application. I recommend it. Um, you can run it as a web app. You can run it on your iPhone or Android. Um, and soon as a desktop application through the Apple App Store. So you can literally run it three okay. different ways. And those lines will blur, so I think pretty much this, everything's going to be uh, kind of a commingled environment for the, for the next three or four years. Okay, okay. Well, tell me uh, this. Uh, when it comes to browser statistics, we noticed, uh, for example, through Network World, and these are global browser statistics according to Network World. They felt that in 2010, you know, in October 2010, there's a bit of a milestone that that Internet Explorer's worldwide market share actually fell below 50 percent. Did you find that also in the University of Phoenix? No, we we, we don't. Okay, what'd you find? Yeah. Um, we have, we have a large proportion of, of students that are using, that will catch up on, say, a discussion item in their classroom from their workplace. <laughs> so, uh, like, maybe toward the end of the day, they'll check in and see if they have a message from their instructor. And uh, as, you, as you well know in the corporate world today, many, many, many corporations are still running um, 
Microsoft XP environment with IE6. Sure, there you go. So, uh, or they may have the individual users may uh, be running IE7 uh, or IE8, so etc. Um, so but a lot of corporations will will mandate right uh, the use of a particular browser, you know, correct. and version. Yeah. So we're getting a somewhat inflated IE percentage, uh, approximately uh, close to seventy percent IE. Seventy uh, percent, interesting. But we find that is that, interesting. That's really interesting. But we find that toward the in the evening, uh, toward the end, toward, toward the end of the workday, uh, we see that the percentages go way up for the other browsers. So we're, what we're seeing is a is a workday check-in effect. So, so I think the hardcore uh, homework people are doing at home is going to be uh, on a higher percentage of Mozilla, uh, Firefox, Chrome, and, and so on. But IE remains kind of the tool of business still. It does. For a lot of people, it still is. Yeah. Okay. For some people, you have to pry their IE out of their fingers, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're willing to help. No, just kidding. I, yeah. what was interesting, I, <laughs> what, no, it's interesting, though, because if there is this trend of IE dropping, it sounds like it's because of individual use as opposed to any corporate adoption. I mean, you know, maybe that's a little too right. cut and dry, but, yeah, but why, not, why not try? Yeah. It's definitely dropping. It's definitely dropping. Um, okay. uh, every, every holiday season, there's a, there's a, uh, a little bit of a bump in uh, the newer versions of IE uh, Explorer because people get new machines, right? Um, ah, sure. So every January, uh, every web design team uh, hopefully checks their stats, hoping to see less IE um, or less of the IE6. And then sure enough, every January it drops. Um, so, so there's a cyclicality here having to do with purchasing cycles. And I assume that would apply to mobile phones as well. as Yes, as it will. New, very, new very much so. Um, you know, I was just looking at the the uh, W3C W3C support that Microsoft is supporting for uh, Internet Explorer nine. And it's very promising. So, um, yeah. by all means, I think Internet Explorer will become a serious browser again with the IE nine release. I okay, so IE nine, you see that as something that's going to be really you know hip again then. Yes, I do. I see. Okay, IE9. I see. Reestablishing a space for Microsoft in the browser environment. No, and uh, I'll have to interject, I, yeah. James. I've I've heard a lot. I've I've heard a lot of similar comments. To just what Chris was saying about IE nine, and that on that last slide that you had with that with that you know huge drop in IE. Um, some of the some of the items that I'd read also said that you know this is probably you know a, a small speed bump for for IE because IE nine does look you know from the beta versions does look very promising as far as the functionality and capabilities of it, and that once IE nine is 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 really released, then there'll be a jump back towards the the, the Microsoft browser, which I thought was really kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, we 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 saw this, you know, back uh, clear back in the day when there was that battle between you know Netscape and IE and all that, and then of course and of course now, and uh, I, they could be poised to bring you know to bring it back, as it were. Uh, Chris, you're going to say something? Yeah, I agree. I I nine. Uh, there's uh, a link I can share with you guys in a bit about uh, IE nine has a nice demo site about how well they support um, some of the HTML five elements and integration with CSS three. So yeah, it's it, very good. It's going to be it's going to be great. Uh, it's going to be really nice to see that hit the market. But back on back on this slide, James, that that you've got yeah. on here, and Chris, I've got I've got a question for you. You know, you, you primarily said you know IE uh, is 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 what you're seeing coming in, and then towards the evening it slacks off to some of the other browsers. And and I'm just wondering. I mean, this is a pretty good list of browsers that's on the screen right now. You know, Flock for your social social media uh, browsing. Um, and, and then a list of others, and I'm just wondering, do you really see much much browser usage um, other than really IE or Firefox or, or Opera or something like that? Or you know, what typically do you see as as far as coming in? And then and then kind of an offshoot of that, how much do you see an uptake um, recently in in people accessing from from mobile mobile browsers, or do you? Uh, we've had a huge increase in mobile app uh, usage. Um, 
Yeah, it's gone up quite a bit, and uh, it's somewhat concurrent with the first release of a uh, demo mobile application to part of our business mm -hmm. school. Um, but for us, it is the major browsers. It's Microsoft Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Opera uh, in that order. And uh, we get somewhat more. Actually, we flip Safari and Opera for our, for in our usage. Um, we get is that right? So, so uh, Opera over Safari. I somehow find that surprising. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's because of uh, uh, it's been very very close for us though. But it's okay. Now I've got another uh, one here from the W3C, and this is the W3C talking about not really, you know, they're global, but it, let's put it this way, their website. So visitors to their website. Notice the difference. Firefox is actually much higher. In, in this previous slide, IE was at about, what, 57%? Now it's 27%. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you see a downward trend. If you take a look at January 2009 at the bottom of the screen, and then if you take a look at December 2010, you can see that steady drop and then the corresponding increase with Firefox and, and Chrome. I find that interesting. But this brings up the point, I think, uh, Chris, that, you, that you've brought up other designers, for example, uh, developers, uh, Eric Meyer, who we had on here a couple of webcasts ago. You want to pay attention to your own website, right, as opposed to what the, the trends are. Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, you you, uh, you have to understand, if you have a, a particular application, which is kind of, you really want to probe the limits of, for example, how you want to mm -hmm. use CSS3. And, that, and if that's really important to you, um, you have to understand if there are users who uh, are willing to switch over to a different browser or have workarounds or if you need to do extra work to create compatibility between um, how much of your style or presentation for your application that's dependent okay. Yeah. on your CSS. How much work would you need to do, for example, with uh, a uh, JavaScript application like Modernizer, which allows you to uh, do some emulation of CSS3 for um, older browsers? Interesting. OK. Well, th th thanks, Chris. Uh, is it yet another statistical analysis from yet another site? Showing you know that Internet Explorer seems to be uh, you know leveling off over uh, you know from say September August 2010 still increasing, but look at the uh, large rise in Firefox 3.6, i.e. Uh, 7.0 dropping off, and then there's what you noticed uh, at University of Phoenix that i.e. 6 has you know dropped quite a bit right you know over over the year. You know, freeing everybody up. For some reason, I can't help but think the end of Star Wars episode. What was that? The episode six, where the you know, <laughs> everybody liberated, and all sorts of you know, furry animals are are, are singing happily. Um, yeah. Oh well. This is um, IE six is is pure evil uh, in the web world. <laughs> Absolutely the worst thing to ever happen to us as as a design as a designer. It, it is horribly limiting uh, to what you can do. Okay. Well, it's, it's the, good, it's good like that they've four all over again. You know. It's really? So I. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So that was their Windows. Uh, you know. You know, Millennium and Windows XT. You know. Well, not so much XT, but. Uh, you know. Uh, oh, sorry, man. What was the version of Windows that everybody just loved? <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh yeah. <laughs> ME. Windows ME. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not only ME, but. Uh, what was it? Just uh, you know, everybody wanted to go back to XP. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, here's yet another statistic uh, showing that Chrome seems to have really picked up a lot of, uh, uh, you know, quite a bit of jump. Uh, have you seen that at University of Phoenix as well? Yep. Huge increase. Okay. Okay. Now we talked about mobile browsers, and this is one from StatCounter.com, and I don't know if this is anywhere near what you've seen at University of Phoenix. I, I was. To be honest, kind of surprised that Opera Mini, uh, you know, was over the iPhone in terms of adoption, and uh, BlackBerry's relative strength. I was a bit surprised. What have you found, you know, to get yeah, Opera? Opera is still dominant. It's on all those Nokia devices. Um, I think. Okay. It, it's got a huge 
just by number, it's got a, a very large presence. But uh, for people who actually, um, you know, spend more time on something like an application, it's going to be iPhone and uh, Android. So iPhone and Android. Yeah, it's kind of what I expect. Uh, what I expected, anyway. I also noticed I, I, I'm clicking on here not only mobile browser, but also mobile browser and the operating system that they're sitting on on top of. So there's Symbian OS and then iOS, and I'm noting that you've got some drops there. But notice, uh, at least according to Stat Counter, that BlackBerry seems to have had a nice rise through 2010, which I, uh, you know, which I found a bit surprising. Uh, and, but then I noticed also that there's quite a jump in the Android, you know, starting from about June of 2010 on up. And I, I would imagine that would be a trend that would continue. What, do, what are your observations on that? Yeah, I, I see Android becoming a huge presence. Um, the integration with the Google Apps uh, is obviously one of the core strengths of, the, of any Android device. Uh, okay. A pure Android application like the Google Nexus is where you can see it fully uh, in all its glory um, without the interpolation of a particular carrier uh, uh, getting in the way on top yeah. of it, you know. But yeah, uh, I, I see whatever cool stuff that Google comes up with could could make Android soar. Yeah. Okay, interesting. What I've noticed is that it's a change the metaphor from browser wars to kind of a poker game. Imagine you've got Internet Explorer and you've got IE. Uh, sorry, you've got Firefox and you've got Chrome and all the browsers offer hanging around the desktop-based computer browsers. And they're sitting around the table ending up and see who's going to win this. And, and to me, it's the mobile app that's kind of come in and raided the game, and especially and the mobile browser, you know, uh, kind of mm -hmm. taking it over. Uh, not, you and I talked about that a bit. It sounds like you pretty much agree with that. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's going to become ubiquitous uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is probably going to make people rethink the, obviously, it, it all comes back again to, to the line of uh, application versus destination website. They're going to be one and the same. So, and the, okay. all the OS intermingling um, is going to reflect that. Let's talk about you know some of the questions that you ask yourself as a designer. We, we kind of hit this earlier. You know, global stats, you know, from W3C or from wherever may not matter, or that really don't matter as much as your own audience. So I assume that you find out from your server logs and surveys. You mentioned focus groups about uh, 15 minutes ago. How exactly do you find out you know what people are using to to verify what your CEO is saying in, the, in terms of, you know, the browser is dead or, or long live the browser or, or what have you? Um, well, but where do you get your info, I guess, is the question. Well, we, obviously, you know, we start with Google Analytics. Is okay. um, uh, The organization also has a building a, an investment in core metrics, which is another application. Um, and uh, the uh, we have we have people who visit uh, anecdotally to you know tell our instructors what they do in discussions and chat about what their habits are. We get in, that information as well. So that um, that is an important input, though. Is it? Is it? You know. Okay. okay interesting. Actually, I, I'm checking the stats now. Uh, one more time. The latest um, actually, uh, Safari has surged w way up. Recently, we're now at 5.27 percent for Safari, which is a huge jump. Wow! When you say recently, over the last six months, or over the last two days, or the last uh, no, over the last four months, it's it's gone up okay. quite a bit. And oh, Opera okay. has dropped off actually, so we've kind of reversed the previous trend, and uh, we now have Chrome at 6.65 percent, and Firefox at 20 percent. So um, again, it's that corporate. Checking your uh, your work your stuff from work effect that gives us a high IE penetration. I don't think is that, that what people do at home. Okay, no, it sounds like not. But uh, but it, that goes to the demographics, understanding the demographics of your site, and then developing accordingly. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. It's knowing As your designer, audience. Oh, yeah, knowing your audience. Yeah. Well, as a designer, uh, and Stephen, if you want to, uh, you know, chime in on this too. 
what should you you know what would you invest in in your particular situation, Chris? Uh, let me rephrase it a bit. What have you invested in as a designer in the various technologies? You know, whether Flash and Ajax, Flex. What are the things that have worked for you in your situation? Um, well, you know, first, uh, the awareness of, of how you use an application, how your peers use an application. What are the suite of tools that, that help you understand what you're consuming? It, you know, you can start very, very simply. You can go to Mozilla. You can you can get Fire or you can get an add-on called Firebug, which many many of you probably already use. Yeah, I like Firebug a lot. Yeah. And you know that this uh, add-on lets you look at the the DOM or the actual internal layout of the web page you're looking at. And uh, you know, as a designer, that's one of your fundamental tools, as both as a, even as a consumer and as a beginning web designer or as somebody mm -hmm. who wants to go into scripting. Um, the kind of to answer your question or the, to invest versus the awareness and education about where everything's going and what people what are the cutting edge things I'll give you an example um, uh, Drew Paul just uh, I think that's how you pronounce it the CMS content management system just had a major release that I think last month or last week okay. uh, they're up to they're up to version seven and uh, you know, I just watched a webcast of uh, a designer who um, created their new default theme, which has a lot more CSS3 and is getting rid of a lot of tables. It's separating a lot of the markup away from the uh, the design. And um, she kind of took this on as a project. She became a Drupal kind of enthusiast. Is not a developer. Uh, she became aware of what the community needed and delved into the CSS and how it could work with Drupal, which is a very much a CMS that could you could make into anything you want. So it's a huge design challenge. But that's a good example of somebody who invested in a particular again, you know, awareness of what people really need. Uh, they need a flexible, extensible CSS platform that has CSS three and uh, made use of whatever uh, XHTML standards, you know, strict standards that they could get, and planning and have CSS in place and planning in place to use HTML5 with future releases. So, okay, so do, so University of Phoenix uses Drupal, for example, too. Or oh, excellent. Call it Drupal. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, and and CSS5 and HTML. Sorry, CSS3 and HTML5 become very important. Yeah. So that's an example of a, of a woman. Um, Jennifer Dunhill, I think I might have her name wrong, but she's someone who just kind of invested in that CMS and that time and, and how it, to apply CSS to uh, that environment. Um, that said, and a lot of us have heard about how Apple excluded Flash from yeah. the iPad. Should people learn Flash? Yeah, I think they still should. I'll give you an example of why. Um, in my team, I mentioned that we have this... Uh, we have various disciplines. All of them are covered under something like C CIW in some way. Uh, but we have people who come in with maybe some specialist knowledge about research. Um, they need might need to test something before an application is fully fledged. You can use Flash. Flash is ideal for creating, uh, taking a series of comps or uh, you know mockups stringing them together with some basic functionality to test how an application would work. And you can get early testing data on that. So you can do that fail early, fail often uh, type of uh, development environment that uh, places like Apple and Google use so successfully in Facebook. So Flash is ideal for prototype testing. You, you know, and you might be working on an application that you know will eventually be built out with HTML5 using JavaScript and the canvas to create animations. But you might be able to test it in Flash because the investment in the code for the JavaScript and HTML5 might not be available yet. So Flash is still useful. And uh, when you have tools like Adobe Catalyst, uh, which lets you build out uh, from Illustrator into Flash and Flex, uh, 
more easily, then you know it's still a very viable uh, platform. Okay. Um, the uh, that said, jQuery is a is a really important thing. Probably every designer needs to be aware of and, and play with at some point. Um, Good. We just uh, we're just updating our JavaScript book to uh, to you know have a lot of the jQuery in there. Uh, you know the libraries and things like that. So, okay. Yeah. So that's good. That's a, you find that an essential tool then. Okay. Yep. Uh, what about uh, uh, you know uh, WAP WML? Do you are you do you work with that very much? Uh, not really. I think you know, we, what, you know the, the wireless. You know the markup language. You know for mobile platforms things like that. Okay. Yeah, just it, it definitely yeah. has its applications. I would say that. Uh, uh, we're kind of doing end run around that on our side. Okay. Um, uh, I personally am not am not using it right now. We, we do have people okay. that are more familiar with it. I'll give you an example. There's the Sensha uh, development toolkit for mobile apps, iPhone. Um, some of the toolkits are allowing you to get some of that um, wireless protocol support without having to delve into it. Hmm. Okay, very good. What, how much do you work with, I have to worry about, you know, what browsers support JavaScript and, you know, again, CSS and, you know, buggy support and things, you know, support that is kind of buggy or, or inconsistent. I guess, I guess that goes back to your IE6 issues. But how much do you have to worry about that when you're implementing things like, uh, you know, JavaScript or other technologies? Uh, for the JavaScript side, it's not that much of an issue. The okay. CSS, CSS2 and CSS3 is a big deal for IE7, IE8. Um, that's still, IE is still an anchor in that space. Okay. So okay, for, I'll, give an example. I'll, I'll give you an example right, right now that I'm working with actually today. Um, mm -hmm. We got a series of comps and designs uh, for having rounded buttons on a home page for things that you do. Right. The, question came, the question came up, how do we emulate this for IE users? And the answer came back, you know what, we're not going to for this release. So we're going to have a square button for some people that use IE in one particular application. Um, huh. Those are the kind of trade-offs you have to do. Uh, a couple of webcasts ago, we had uh, uh, Ashley Craft, one of our uh, designers. She's talking about how you make sure that things fail gracefully. In other words, if a browser comes up that can't handle it, then you, you you make sure that your pages can accommodate you know the lowest common denominator, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, you know, you work with uh, various color schemes, you know, shadowing text, and you know, you, you choose fonts well. In fact, we're going to get into that here in just a second. But one thing that we uh, talked about with the advent of mobile browsers, the different types of, uh, you know, resolutions that you can work with. I assume that most people on this call understand the standard uh, resolutions having to do with, you know, your web desktop. But uh, what are some of the resolutions that you've had to worry about or think about? In terms of mobile uh, devices, and and this image here that I'm that we're showing here uh, shows some of the typical you know pixel sizes. Right. Uh, um, what are some of the what are some of the things that you've had to take into consideration there? Yeah, we're we're designing applications for students for the most part. They're usually doing interactions that are text heavy. Um, we're not. Okay. Uh, we're we're really discounting smaller sizes. Someone's not going to be, again, designing for your audience. Yeah. Someone is going to be um, really going to want to use the application at a larger size. With the advent of the retina displays for uh, mm -hmm. iOS um, family with iPads and phones, uh, the much higher resolution, you know, there even. Okay. Uh, Basically, okay. we're taking an iPad screen, and that's our design standard now for the phones. Okay, so that that is exactly how you how you approach it. You just basically look at the latest iPad and go from there. Yep. Huh. 
Very good. Now, as a designer, how much uh, project management and things like that do you have to work with in terms of, you know, I, kind of a leading question or silly question, really, but I mean, you know, it's not just a, a and this is to young designers out there in the audience, uh, it's not just a willy-nilly, I, I work on what I want to work on, right? I mean, you, your time is, you know, hopefully well, you know, regulated, is it not, Chris? I mean, as a designer, how much is that, uh, is project management important for you? Yeah, it's it's uh, huge. Uh, in today's, in any kind of larger development environment, even a lot of small ones that I know about from colleagues, mm -hmm. um, there is a developmental discipline, uh, development, product development discipline um, called, uh, well, it's, you know, it's agile, what they call it. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Tell them more about uh, agile. Yeah. yeah, you don't you don't worry about having a um, extremely highly detailed uh, pr uh, product release list and a list of requirements, highly detailed requirements, which are fully fleshed out, handed to a set of design uh, development designers, developers and then completed, checked off, and moved into a uh, quality assurance um, testing phase. Mm -hmm. Generally, things work in a sprint mode now in many corporations, and they hire dedicated sprint managers who set up two- and three-week cycles of development. Product managers create what they call backlog items, which are a list of requirements for a particular sprint. And as new features are phased into a particular product set or new products are launched, the backlog items are re-examined, adjusted, and uh, moved forward or eliminated for the next sprint. And you have sprint review meetings every couple of weeks where you examine how many of those backlog items or features, in a sense, are incorporated into that sprint release. So, so um, in talking, so in talking about all the different types of browsers, for example, if you find that one browser takes a jump or you know in popularity or whatever, it's these sprint sessions that can allow you to to adjust your approach. Exactly, and the sprint session, uh, allow the the the, uh, the sprint cycles can allow a quick turn in strategy. For example, I mentioned, uh, you know, we're dealing with students in our applications. We want people to be able to comfortably read a fair amount of text. Um, do we want to, you know, make an adjustment in how uh, we deliver to the iPad, you know? Um, sure. So we do want to change font settings and so on. Um, that's pretty much a very popular model these days. It's spreading. Um, the sprint okay, so folks can go... Yeah, folks yeah. can Google that and learn more about the Sprint model. Or I would start about the Agile model in Sprint, right? The Agile model as it's incorporated into a Sprint cycle. Yeah, ah. it's, it's pretty much okay. becoming fairly ubiquitous in the in the uh, the work in the product development world. Facebook is a something of an interesting exception. Um, hmm. They use Agile management, but Facebook is a uh, very much a engineer-centered uh, organization, and the engineers petition other specialties within their organization to work on their projects. So it's essentially the same developmental cycle where you go through a sprint cycle and then you go into a development release, into mm -hmm. QA release, and then production. But uh, for Facebook, uh, it's quite interesting to note how they do it. You, for example, as a designer, you might be approached by a engineer to say, "Hey, I like your work. Do you want to work on my project?" Kind of interesting. So, wow, and that doesn't ensue chaos. That, that bring in chaos. That, that actually works for them. Ev evidently not. I, I think yeah. there's, there's <laughs> yeah. room for different product management styles in, in the in the corporate world today, and you're going to see a lot of different stuff. But the agile model is is becoming ubiquitous. Okay.
Well, speaking of Sprint, let me see if I can move on to some uh, some observations about uh, that you have about HTML5. We've got an image here coming up here about it. Tell, uh, it. tell us more about what you'd like to do, and I want to make sure we get through these slides here uh, about from your specific input. Sure. Um, this is the new HTML5 logo as, as released by the W3C. It's pretty snazzy, mm -hmm. I think. Um, they're obviously pushing HTML5 as almost like a brand. So. It's interesting. They sure seem to be, yeah. Now, this next one is talking about the different things that are available, right? Uh, you know, talking about multimedia, right? Right. Um, the, uh, uh, currently, when you go on YouTube, for most people, you see Flash delivering your sure. video. Um, HTML5 oh, yeah, okay. is going to change that, and you'll be able to uh, view video, control video, have built-in browser control or whatever other you know app you're viewing it, viewing it from um, outside of Flash it would be native. To yeah, app. it's going to be uh, native to the web as one of our previous uh, uh, presenters uh, stated. Good. Right, it, you know, it's not going to be plug-in based, and that's so that's really exciting. And also CSS3, tell us about uh, you know what CSS3 does better than CSS2. You know, at least from your perspective at the University of Phoenix. Um, well, CSS3 does, is going to do four things for us. Uh, it's okay. going to give us built-in uh, ability to segment, uh, you know, data on the screen. You'll be, we'll be able to use the built-in um, column type of formatting. Uh, we can add rounded corners quite easily. We can add drop shadows quite easily. We can play with transparencies. Um, we can do all of that with CSS3 effortlessly. So it makes the, makes the browser develop, uh, deliver much more sophisticated applications and also more aesthetically pleasing. Correct. It will allow uh, a lot of the CSS style sheets to be greatly trimmed down in size, reduce the weight, speed up delivery, and have a better looking uh, appearance. Now, uh, one thing you noted uh, in your uh, in the, some of the images you sent to me, Chris, the, uh, the HTML5 video player, right? That that uh, YouTube is messing with. Yeah, now, you, or, you can know, go to you, know. you can go to YouTube right now, depending upon your browser, and you can experience the HTML5 uh, implementation of the videos. Um, Good. And yeah. I know they had some issues with security on some of this early on, but I, I'm sure they're working on it, getting it fixed up. Yep. And you can even do it with a Google Chrome frame on top of uh, IE6. I'll explain that a little bit uh, first. Explain yeah, that. it's like a shiv uh, that, Go that Google created to force IE6 to recognize uh, the, the modern box model and to accept um, uh, an HTML5 tag. Now, I see I haven't kept up with that. So you're saying that, that if you've got both installed, then uh, it, it, it uh, Chrome allows a workaround for HTML5. Yeah, yeah. Huh. It, it, a little kludgy, but it seems to work. Um, yeah, hey, kludgy with the internet. Man. Yeah, this next slide shows, uh, you know, uh, Internet uh, Explorer 9 beta released uh, September 15th, 2010. Um, yeah, you, it was fun to download that and, and, and mess around with it a little bit. So yeah, I think good. everybody should uh, should play with that if they can, if they don't want to screw up their system. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful with that. I noticed here you sent a couple of New York Times uh, uh, Article yeah. in here. I assume you're not going to talk politics. We're going to talk design. So go ahead. Exactly. Uh, this is something that you can get uh, right now from your mm -hmm. Chrome App Store. So here, here we see an interesting trend of browser, uh, you know, maker. Oh, well, I should say the Google pushing through their browser an App Store, kind of like. Apple might do, and which Apple is doing. There's app stores everywhere now, right? Sure. Um, and here is an application that's running HTML5, and it's very iPad-like in its experience. And you got this from where again? So this everybody can go up there. This is this is a widget you can run from the huh. Google uh, Chrome App Store, I should say. And uh, you can install this, and it sets up this HTML5 implementation of a New York Times feed. And it's really it's And this really is right on your desktop. You can go grab it. Yep, you can go grab it and then you, cool. can, you can resize it very easily and, and all the stories uh, reformat themselves and flow quite nicely on the page. 
Well, so this is kind of the idea of once again that you know the browser is dead, and you know here's a yeah. widget install the browser. But that's interesting that the 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 web seems to kind of reassert itself here, though, in a sense that uh, it's dead, but now it's alive again. You know, exactly. King is dead long ago. Sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, here's the next uh, uh, next little uh, uh, example. Uh, similar sort of thing comes from the same Chrome application, widget. and it shows how you can flip between different styles uh, for how you want the news to be viewed. So uh, it's oh. quite a, it's very very it's become a very popular widget, and it's you can see how people are responding to it. So it's very good stuff. Okay, good. Now uh, uh, add-ons. What are some of the add-ons that you like? You mentioned yeah, right here's Firebox. Great some great add-ons. We already mentioned Firebug. Everybody should get Firebug for their Mozilla browser. It is absolutely essential. Um, here's another fun one we use. Uh, and when you're working with other people, Notable. Um, Notable. Okay. From, uh, if you look up Notable add-on on Mozilla, you'll find it, of course. And this here, you can see what you can do is it, you, you install this and you can Take a snapshot of a page, take notes, and then share it with people. Cool. And if they nice, have nice. the, uh, if they also have the add-on, of course, you can just very seamlessly share these notes. It's a great way to like you want to release your site to your customer. We both have this uh, Notable app. You can very quickly gather notes uh, on your work and do some quick iterations. It's an awesome application. It's pretty. It's interesting. So uh, the browser may be dead, uh, possibly for the end user, but for the developer, it sounds like more and more. It, I mean, it, it's being used uh, to develop with this, uh, with oh, all yeah. these add-ons. Oh yeah, and there's gonna there's gonna be very oh. similar stuff too for uh, uh, you know working with other other applications. Okay. okay. I've got the Zelman.com up here. So tell us more yeah, about this particular one. File this under the category of really fun, cool design sites. Jeffrey Zelman is the design pioneer. Um, yeah. His site always seems to have really cool links to a list of parts, uh, which he helped start, and others just good design principles. This is uh, a list, a list of part. part. That's a great website. In fact, uh, we had Eric Meyer on here who runs an event apart. He's he's one of the, he's one of the editors of a list of part. Uh, he's been on on the webcast. So Eric Meyer is so. the uh, CSS god, is he not? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, these are all very good sites to be uh, keeping up on the browser wars, keep up on uh, various technologies. Uh, Pattern Tap, I, I didn't know this one. Tell us more about this one. Yeah, this is a great site. This is one of my new favorites. Pattern Tap, you can go on there and see how do other uh, companies, and uh, this is just one example, how do they use thumbnails? Hmm. Um, you can go on there and see how people use dropdowns, uh, how they use mouse over events to inform a user of status. Form validation. You can see really cool examples of core application principles, interactions, and patterns being done in very creative ways. So um, there's huge collections yeah. of these things. Uh, as you can okay. see, just just from thumbnails, there's a there's 200 examples. So. Sure, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. Now we got Font Squirrel. Uh, basically, a, a way to get. Yeah, I yeah, like I this open source kind of fonts, right? Exactly. Which you can you can use. This is a this is a great site. You can go on there and um, get a font web kit to use with CSS3. Um, so the font is shown natively, you know, in the browser. It's it's, it's delivered uh, with uh, as a at font base. Uh, so you can use all kinds of fonts. Oh, very good. And then we have here, this might be the last one here, wireframes, uh, something you wanted to bring up in terms of, you know, this is how you start diagramming a site and, and anticipating end user interaction, right? Tell us more about this. Yeah, there might be one slide after this, but this is what I would get okay. from an interaction designer, or this is, might be something I'd create in mm -hmm. consultation with, uh, uh, say, a product person, product manager. So. You know, somebody who has CIW certification might be starting from exactly something like this. The product development group says, we're going to investigate, um, we're going to try to do some A-B testing. We're going to try to create two different versions of uh, a particular new page. We want to test uh, how uh, people use logged out stuff, how they use logged in. 
Maybe we'll create two different versions of each. We'll play around with elements. They block out sections, and you as a designer can get to work in something like Illustrator or Photoshop or let's say you're on the Mac, OmniGraffle, um, and you can play around with one of these grayscale wireframes and then move into, say, Photoshop for more detail and then uh, work as put on your uh, web designer hat and actually create some of the CSS or hand it off to somebody else. So you might have interactions like that, but this is often what you start with. So this is the architecture, as it were, depending on whether you're logged in or logged out. And then that turns into the, you know, the real site, right? You, know, you, you, you turn that from a wireframe right into your actual site. Yeah, and this is what I was working on this morning before the call. And uh, huh. I'm just playing around with some prototypes, uh, some, some mock-ups, I should say, uh, in Photoshop. So, you know, how, what kind of grid am I going to be working with here? What kind of gutter space am I going to have? What kind of colors are going to pop on this page? What complements the brand, which is red? All these kind of questions, obviously, so you've uh, got your questions to anybody who yeah. um, Very good. So you got your red brand here, and then you know the gutter space things, This right? Uh, I'm trying to use my mouse here, but you know, on the sides, right? And plenty of white space and things of that nature, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying some, some different things on the page, trying to fit into an existing design. How much room will I have to display what, in this case, is going to be a prototype for uh, self-assessment, self-testing? So uh, you're balancing, in this case, color, positioning, branding, and grid with an existing site, a new grid. Um, this is going to be more of a Facebook-style grid. So, um, wow. yeah, so the, wow. these are the kind of things you have to balance. It's uh, all part of the job. It's all the kind of, the kind of stuff you, you learn with CIW. And uh, when you get to apply it in an interdisciplinary team uh, with uh, a big product base, um, it can be uh, frustrating at times and a lot of fun at others. Well, yeah, well, well, in, any time you work with a team, you know, there's all sorts of challenges, but the benefits are so you know, are massive. And that's one thing with CIW that we teach is a team about a team based approach to design, you know, so that you understand all the development principles. And we teach that right at the foundations level, starting with our Web Foundations Associate Certification. And of course, our CIW Design Special Certification discusses exactly what Chris is talking about in terms of wireframes, uh, you know, site maps, move, uh, uh, moving them right into an actual production website. Of course, e-commerce specialist teaches how to create storefront services, do a shopping cart, also some uh, great e-learning stuff you'll find in there. For those who need to move on to jQuery and JavaScript, jQuery is a bit of JavaScript there, we also offer development level certifications, JavaScript, Perl, and database design, and as well as web security. So Chris, I want to thank you. Uh, we're running a, just a bit over here, but I want to thank you very much for the time that you've spent. Uh, looking at the uh, your perspective from the University of Phoenix, uh, and uh, you know what the browser wars are looking like, and, and the importance of the you know ways to keep abreast of all of that. Stephen, anything that you'd uh, like to uh, add in here? Well, I just I just like to thank Chris for joining also, but also you know it's a lot of the points that he brought up. You know, just just really driving the way that the design is 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 taking shape today. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of argue that the not the browser is not really dead, but but maybe the operating system, the OS, is becoming yeah. obsolete, and the browser is taking its place because those yeah. a lot of those apps, you know, they're actually running in, in conjunction, ubiquitous with the with the browser, as Chris was saying. So, so I, yeah. I, I think the browser's got a long way to go. I think the browser could be yeah. I think the browser as we know it is dead. Is that we're just going to have to redefine it, and yeah, it's going to include the OS or, or obviate it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a very much a mixed environment, but all of the core disciplines all still apply. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you uh, very much for all these observations, Stephen and, and Chris. Our next webinar, in fact, is about JavaScript. It's not your father's JavaScript anymore. So we're going to be talking about how to use JavaScript for fun and for profit. Uh, that'll be uh, coming up in a while in March. We'll be doing it March 30th and 31st. Also, tomorrow we'll be doing the same webcast here that we just talked about. So if you want to get uh, uh, more treatment about, uh, more discussion about Chris's perspective from the University of Phoenix, 
uh, we're uh, you know we're you're happy to come on. Uh, we're happy to have you on board. You can go to Twitter. Dot com CIW is certified for more updates about CIW and here's contact information again you'll be getting a copy a PDF copy of this uh, particular uh, webcast uh, uh, of these slides and we're happy to uh, have had you on board so thank you everybody for your time and once again Chris and Stephen thanks again for your time man you're very welcome it's been fun absolutely have a good day have a good day Lisa I'll hand it over to you today. we appreciate it you take care everyone bye bye.